Karl Barth wrote tons of thousand-page books to say what every Sunday school kid already knows. The answer to every theological question is Jesus. Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where we build churches in Minecraft while talking about Christianity. So, the contest is over for naming the Presbyterian Parrot. You guys voted on John the Independent Fundamental Baptist, so I guess the Parrot wouldn't be Presbyterian. Unfortunately, it looks like the Parrot died while I was away. Someone said he was trying to warn me of something, but didn't know what, and these are his remains. So, that's unfortunate, but yeah, he would have been called John the Independent Fundamental Baptist. On that happy note, today let's talk about Karl Barth, who is probably the most influential theologian of the ah, probably the most influential theologian of the 20th century. He's especially influential on in reformed theology because he comes from the Re reformed tradition. So in my Mastering Reformed Theology series, the series that's like a lot more serious than this one, my Mastering Reformed Theology series, I did one whole episode basically on Karl Barth and Neo-Orthodoxy. Neo-Orthodoxy was his movement, and this doesn't have anything to do with Eastern Orthodoxy. The word Orthodox just means right belief. So the super-duper short history of Neo-Orthodoxy is that um, Protestants used to just believe in, you know, traditional theology, traditional lowercase o Christianity. But then, liberalism took over a lot of the Protestant and Reformed churches. Theological liberalism, where people are like, yeah, you don't really need to believe in the Bible, it's okay if you believe it's all a metaphor. But then Karl Barth came along and explained why liberalism is really stupid. Uh, so that's the super short history of neo-orthodoxy. Neo-orthodoxy was Karl Barth and a bunch of other theologians explaining why liberalism fails. But the thing is, they didn't completely go back to the traditional beliefs either. So they're kind of a mixed bag. And the, one of the biggest debates in Reformed theology today is, is neo-orthodoxy really orthodox? Did Karl Barth really return to traditional orthodoxy, or did he just find an unsatisfactory compromise between traditional theology and liberalism? So I'm going to go over in this video the things I like about Karl Barth and the things I don't like about Karl Barth. Now, the first thing I have to get out of the way, the elephant in the room, is yes, Karl Barth sort of did have an affair. He had an arranged marriage, so he never really um, had a great relationship with his wife, and he had this secretary uh, who helped him write a lot of his works, a lot of his books, and he clearly did like her. He invited her to live with him, and his wife and kids did not like that. Now, he probably didn't do anything physical with her, but it's still emotional adultery that he committed, even if he didn't physically act on it. It's still not good. So, he is a sinner, just like all of us are sinners, but what he did there was not cool. And even the most, you know, passionate Bart fans that I know, Carl Bart fans, uh, do not defend his actions there. And it was quite scandalous when it was discovered. So, we have to see him as a normal sinner. Now, there are have been sinners that have been very important for the Christian faith, people who have had lots of personal scandal. Like, even some of the greatest heroes, greatest saints in church history have had personal scandals as well. And, you know, King David and King Solomon, you know, they had a lot of scandals themselves, and their scandals were after their glory days. It's not like they had a very uh, promiscuous childhood like St. Augustine had, but then had a dramatic conversion experience. I was surprised when I was reading the Bible, reading about King David and King Solomon, that their, uh, their times of sin, their sort of downfall came after they, they really peaked, after their times of glory and success. And that shows, I think, the point of the, what the Bible's trying to say is that even the greatest heroes of the faith still fail, still have lots of moral failings. So we're going to talk about Karl Barth's ideas. We're not going to glorify him. We're not going to demonize him. We're going to talk about his ideas because his ideas have been very influential on the entire church, not just the Protestant churches. Catholic and Eastern Orthodox theologians have also been influenced by him. So he's a figure that we have to reckon with whether we like him or not because he's a big part of the conversation. So he said a lot of different things, but the main theme in all of his writings is that every area of theology needs to be explicitly Christ-centered. He's by far the most radically Christocentric theologian that there ever was. 
So this is how he rejected liberalism. So liberalism is basically natural theology taken to the radical extreme. Natural theology has always existed in some form in church history, really developed by people like Thomas Aquinas. It basically says there's two ways in which we know truth about God. Yes, we know truth about God from Jesus and the scriptures. That's like special revelation. But we also know truth about God. We can find out about God just by nature. That's why it's called natural revelation. We can just see how physics and logic and philosophy works and learn things about God from that. And that's how Thomas Aquinas will spend like the entire first book of his Summa Contra Gentiles just talking about how we can reason that God exists and what God's attributes are with logic and nature alone, without even needing to appeal to any scripture. So that's natural theology. Now, what liberalism did was it basically said natural theology is, is all that there is. There really is no supernatural revelation from God. The Bible is just a human text. So when we're going to think about what God means to us, we're just going to think in a completely natural, uh, unsupernatural way, and then God ends up just being like a metaphor for love or social justice. So that's liberalism. Liberal theology usually is very skeptical of the supernatural and very skeptical of any sort of divine revelation any sort of special revelation. But what Karl Barth said is, well, then you're not having revelation that's in or through Christ. You're just having your own personal view of what you think the world is, what you think the world should be, and you're projecting God, that onto God, and you're projecting that onto Jesus. And Karl Barth said, everything in theology needs to be about Christ in some way. And if it's not about Christ, we really shouldn't be talking about it. So that means revelation, how we know about God, needs to be through Christ. So that did help defeat theological liberalism. Like, you might think theological liberalism is bad in the mainline churches, and it is. Trust me, I'm PCUSA. I'm in the mainline Presbyterian church. There's a lot of, you know, LGBT, feminism, all that stuff. But people are actually less likely to, like, deny the divinity of Christ and deny the Trinity than they were back in the day when theological liberalism was at its high point, about a hundred years ago, when Karl Barth lived. So there have been improvements in some areas thanks to Bart. Now, we just said that Jesus is really the only revelation that we can have, so Bart was a bit more extreme than a lot of the traditional Reformed theologians, and that's why a lot of Reformed theologians are skeptical of him, because traditional Reformed theology somewhat follows in the footsteps of Thomas Aquinas, saying there's both natural revelation with nature, logic, and philosophy, and there's special revelation, which is in Christ and Scripture. But Bart seems to think the only revelation there is at all is Christ, period. So Bart completely and utterly denies natural revelation, and that's something I'm still wrestling with. I would say that's one of Bart's ideas that I'm more skeptical of, but that leads to another idea of his that I think is actually extremely helpful. And because Bart says Christ is the only revelation, the Bible, then, is only really the Word of God because it tells us about Christ. And I think that's very helpful. That is really helpful in answering a lot of the theologically liberal criticisms of the Bible. So, for example, in theological liberalism, they will pick apart the Bible and say, this totally seems like a human text because we can see that human authors had human motives and human agendas for writing this. This is definitely not the word of God. That's what liberal, high, liberal higher critical scholars will say about the Bible. But then... From Bart's perspective, if you say the Bible is only the word of God because it reveals Christ, because the Holy Spirit reveals Christ to us through it, then you can say, yes, of course the Bible's a human text because Jesus is fully human, but the Bible's also a divine text because Jesus is fully divine. So we should expect the Bible to have the marks of a human text because it is a human text. Just the way Jesus is human, because he really does have a human nature, the Bible has a human nature. The Bible has a human quality to it as well, just like Jesus is truly human. So that helps in recognizing that the Bible is a truly human text, and therefore you shouldn't be surprised if you start studying the Bible and it seems very human. But it goes even further. I think uh, I've pointed out many times that Karl Barth's view of Scripture is very consistent with a Calvinist view of the sacraments. The Calvinist view of the sacraments, and Karl Barth is in the Calvinist tradition, is that uh, the sacraments only really work if you have faith. Meaning that, like for Holy Communion, you're only receiving the body and blood of Christ in communion, and you are. We, we, we're not Zwinglians. We're not uh, memorialists. We don't think communion is just a symbol. 
we do receive the body and blood of Christ if we have faith in Christ, if we're true believers. So according to Calvinism, you only re really receive the body and blood of Christ if you have faith. If an unbeliever receives communion, which they shouldn't, but if they do, uh, they're only receiving bread. That's also what's expressed in like the Anglican 39 articles. And similarly, similarly, Calvinism believes that baptism saves, but once again, only for those who have faith. Baptism is only effective unto salvation for the elect, for those who have faith. So apply this logic then to scripture. Calvinists also believe that scripture, um, well, I would say Bardians, in being consistent with uh, Calvinist view of the means of grace, scriptures only really, we only receive scripture as the word of God if we have faith. So scripture is still the word of God if someone reads it without faith, but they're not receiving it as the word of God. They're only receiving the human aspect of scripture. So what that means basically is when liberal Bible scholars will study the Bible and come to the conclusion that it's not the word of God, we can say, yeah, of course it doesn't seem like the word of God to you. You're not saved. Like actually, because, and this is consistent with a lot of what the church fathers say about the Bible. And it's consistent with what Jesus himself says about the scriptures. Jesus talks a lot about how um, the scriptures so obviously prophesy about him, but the Pharisees are just blind to the meaning of the scriptures. Jesus almost talks about, like, it's being intentionally hidden from them because of how hardened their hearts are against him. So, um... Bart's ideas about the scriptures can sound weird from an evangelical perspective, where you're taught to believe that, like, every single word of the Bible is, like, magic words that fell from heaven. But what Karl Barth says is consistent with what a lot of things that the New Testament, that a lot of things that Jesus says, a lot of things the Church Fathers say. So my favorite of Barth's doctrines is his doctrine of the Word of God. I'm reading his Church Dogmatics, and I'm about halfway through his volumes on the doctrine of the Word of God. So he basically says there's a threefold Word of God. The Word of God can refer to three things. First of all, it really refers to Christ. Christ is the only actual direct revelation of God. Christ is the true Word of God, and the Bible calls Christ the Word of God a lot more than it calls the Bible the Word of God. But we can still say the Bible is the Word of God because the Holy Spirit reveals Christ to us through the Bible. And this isn't some liberal BS of saying, oh, the Bible contains the Word of God, the good parts of the Bible are the Word of God. No, that's not what Bart is saying. Bart is saying the entire Bible is the Word of God because it is the means through which the Holy Spirit reveals Christ, the true Word of God, to us. And the third form of the Word of God is the proclamation of the Word of God. The difference is that the Bible is, you know, always the Word of God. And the proclamation of the Word of God, you know, preaching like sermons and stuff, that's only really the Word of God if it's faithful to Scripture. So you can indeed say, you know, Pastor Billy Bob's sermon was the Word of God if Pastor Billy Bob was preaching faithfully and biblically. But it's not like any old sermon is the Word of God because we are humans. We don't have infallible authority to consistently and always preach the word of God. Uh, the, Karl Barth talks a lot about how the church is always fallible. Another idea of Barth's I really like is that theology is a science. And what do we know about science? We know from science that knowledge is always improving. And even though Barth departs from a lot of more traditional Protestant beliefs, I think a lot of what Barth says helps make sense of Protestantism. Because the most common criticism of Protestantism is it's new. A lot of Protestant ideas are novel. They didn't exist before. Martin Luther was the first one to um, articulate the doctrine of salvation by faith alone. Now, first of all, that's not entirely true. Every single classical Protestant belief has some rootedness in the Church Fathers, and we would say in Scripture, of course. We would say it's, we are building upon the Church Fathers, so they didn't express it exactly the way we would, and we're not saying all the Church Fathers agreed with us on everything, but everything we believe, you can find some precedent for it in the Church Fathers. Um, now, of course, I, Catholics and Orthodox would say the same for their traditions, and I would agree with that. I think all the mainstream Christian traditions that we have today exist in seed form in the Fathers. But because Karl Barth really talks about how theology is a science, 
and he talks about how the church is always fallible, that theology is just a fallible, flawed human attempt to summarize the incomprehensible truth of the gospel, we should actually expect theology to get better over time. A lot of times in theological discourse, we say that an idea is bad if it's new, or that older ideas are always better, but that's not necessarily the case. You know, I think theology was a lot better right after the Council of Nicaea than it was in, like, 100 AD. You know, Justin Martyr, he's one of the very earliest early church fathers. Great theologian, great saint, but the way he articulates the Trinity is a little bit sloppy. And, you know, we can't blame him. He was living before the Council of Nicaea. Any of these uh, councils really hammered out the biblical doctrine of the Trinity and stuff. But I think theology really developed in a positive way over the centuries, um, just the way science does. Science gets better over time. You know, you wouldn't shun air conditioning because you're like, oh, that's like a new science. Back in the day, people didn't use air conditioning. No, you'd say, yeah, they didn't use it back then, but now that we have it, I'm glad we do. So we should make it makes sense at least with the reformed tradition that theology should be improving over time that's why the one of the mottos of the reformation is semper reformanda meaning always reforming according to the word of god so it's not just always reforming according to our personal opinions that is what it is if you're a liberal theologian like many are in the pc usa uh but li the liberalism was a complete rebellion against the traditional protestant beliefs and I think Bart fundamentally is trying to be faithful to traditional Protestantism. He just departs in certain ways, and some of his departures you can understand more than others. So the idea that the theology is a science is really good. It's also really important to understand that the church is always going to be fallible. It's always going to fall short in its attempt to summarize the truths about God and about the gospel. And Karl Bart has been helpful for me in learning to extend charity to those whom, uh, with whom I theologically disagree. Because, yeah, even if I'm right and they're wrong about something, there's definitely something else that I'm wrong about and they're probably right about. Uh, no, I think John Calvin said, no theologian is more than 80% correct. And that's funny because I'm actually 100% correct, but you know what I mean. Anyway. So, what are some other ideas of Bart? This is the other favorite idea um, of Bart's that I have. His centrality of the incarnation. So we talked about how Bart is very Christ-centered about everything. Well, that includes his doctrine of creation. So there's always been a debate in theology, this goes back way before the Reformation, about the incarnation of Christ. Because we all agree that, you know, Christ took on human flesh, uh, the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, became human and died for us. But there's always a question, would he have still done that if Adam hadn't sinned? In other words, is the incarnation of God the Son just a sort of divine plan B to save us for sin, or was there some greater purpose of the incarnation, meaning that he would have done that anyway? And people have always answered this question different, differently throughout church history. So, uh, a famous example of some pe someone who said no, that the Incarnation was really just a remedy for the sin of Adam, is Thomas Aquinas, one of the most influential theologians. But famous people who have said yes, uh, the Son still would have come incarnate, even if Adam hadn't sinned, are people like St. Maximus the Confessor and John Duns Scotus. Lately I've been a big fan of Scotus lately and I'm trying to learn more about him. Uh, Scotus was a contemporary of Aquinas, sort of, and they... Uh, the Scotists and the Thomists uh, debated each other a lot in many ways. So I tend to agree with Scotus on this, and even though a lot of Eastern Orthodox ideas are rooted in John of Damascus' theology, from what I've heard of him, I still need to read, sorry, uh, sorry not John of Damascus, St. Maximus the Confessor. Uh, I still need to read St. Maximus the Confessor, but from what I've heard, a lot of his ideas are things I totally agree with, like the cosmic significance of the incarnation of Christ. So I think it's very important to have an incarnational theology. That's something Bart definitely has. So Bart is definitely on the side of the incarnation still would have happened, even if Adam hadn't sinned, because the whole world is created for the incarnation of Christ. Now let's talk about some of Bart's ideas that are, you know, less good. 
One of his ideas that is really cringe is he was a hyper Zwinglian on the sacraments. Not even a Zwinglian. He was fundamentally a Baptist on the sacraments later in life. I know I have massive hypocrisy and double standards with how I judge people on the sacraments. Like, if a PCA Presbyterian pastor really is a Presbyterian, but articulates the their doctrine of the sacraments in a somewhat Zwinglian way, I'll be like, oh, this person's a total Baptist, you shouldn't listen to them. But when Karl Barth expresses an explicitly, unapologetically Baptist view of the sacraments, where he's even against infant baptism later in life, then I make excuses for him because Karl Barth is one of those elite ivory tower theologians who's, and he is respected in a lot of churches that have stained glass. So that means he's automatically better. Come on, guys. I criticize everyone, so I have to criticize myself as well. Uh, it is a bit hypocritical of me to uh, judge a lot of people harshly for their views of the sacraments, but not Karl Barth. But you guys, you guys know what I mean, that because he was so influential on the Reformed tradition, even though he clearly departed from Reformed theology in many ways, even though in many ways we would say he's not properly Reformed, he is still a part of the Reformed tradition, more generally speaking. Or maybe I'm just coping and doing mental gymnastics, I don't know. So yeah, that's one of the ideas of his that I don't like. Most Bardians reject his view of the sacraments, so that's why I, I still think you can say Bardian theology is part of the broader Reformed tradition in the modern world, even though he's got a lot of critics, and understandably so. Alright, I'm planting some tulips in my Calvinist uh, Presbyterian garden over here. Planting the tulips even though tulip is a 20th century invention that has nothing to do with Calvin himself. Anyway, so yeah, what other ideas of Bart are there? Um, I think those are the main things. He said a lot of things. His church dogmatics is, like, super long. Here's another idea of his that I think is really cringe. And it's that he doesn't seem to think the new heavens and the new earth are really gonna be anything. He seems to think that time is just gonna end and it's it's unclear what he thinks about that i haven't actually read what he thinks about that i've just heard secondhand what he thinks about that but if he really thinks what it sounds like what i've heard then that is really cringe and i think there's other neo-orthodox theologians who are much better about that like i don't know Jürgen Moltmann is actually really good with talking about how everything in creation will be restored. The new heavens and the new earth will restore not just our souls, not just our physical bodies, but like art, music, places, all of that. So Karl Barth does have weaknesses in his theology, but wherever he has a weakness, there are other neo-orthodox theologians who make up for it. Uh, like Jürgen Moltmann, for example, on that. The problem with Jürgen Moltmann is he is... I think he died recently, like, I'm talking literally just a few weeks ago. The problem with Jürgen Moltmann is he's very liberal in some other areas. Like, he's behind a lot of the, you know, feminist left-wing social theology. And he's also very heterodox in his Doctrine of the Trinity. Now, another thing about Barr and Moltmann is... In all of church history, there's a tension between a modalistic and a tritheistic view of the Trinity, where w people always try to find a balance between the oneness of God and the threeness of God in Christian theology. So some people will swing so hard to the oneness side of God that they will become sort of modalists, where they will deny any sort of meaningful distinctions between the persons of the Trinity. And others will try to avoid modalism so hard that they end up becoming basically tri-theists. They'll swing too hard in that direction. So, Bart is someone who seems like a modalist sometimes, and Jürgen Moltmann seems like a tri-theist at times. And I, this is just my personal observation. Generally, modalist theology, or more modalistic theology, is more masculine. It tends, tends to talk more about hard, cold rationality and less about any sort of emotionalism. And even though some people say Bart is kind of liberal in some ways, I think Bart is the most profoundly anti-liberal, masculine way of thinking theologian that has ever existed. Because Bart denies basically any kind of reading emotionalism into theology, any kind of mysticism. He denies um, 
he even denies that the gospel has anything to do with social justice, which is completely different from, you know, your average liberal PC USA pastor who will say the gospel is basically nothing but social justice. So, yeah, I know people have their problems with Bart, but of all the criticisms you can make of him, and there are tons of valid criticisms of him, I don't think you can call him a liberal. I think he is the exact opposite of a liberal. He's so hard in his anti-liberal theology, he swings too far in the opposite direction almost, I would say, in a few ways. Now, uh, it's not just on theology that he's anti-liberal. Some of his views on women and the LGBT community, I think a lot of those liberal PCUSA seminary professors would stop talking about him if they read his views on that. It's like he makes most of the church fathers look like liberal feminists when he talks about those things. I'm not going to repeat what he said, but um, and, and what his comments on that are not very accessible. Not many people know about them, but if you can find them, it's it's quite something. Anyway, so he, he's not a liberal theologically, but that doesn't mean he's completely orthodox either. That's the problem with neo-orthodoxy. I've personally felt myself pulled between the more neo-orthodox impulse and the more traditional, like, Westminsterian Calvinism impulse. So yeah, there's a lot of things about Bart you could say. And at the end of the day, I think it's important to know that everyone contributes to the theological tradition especially everyone in the Reformed tradition, contributes to our theological tradition either by affirmation of their ideas or negation of their ideas. So even people who have mostly bad ideas, like Jürgen Moltmann, or even like even more liberal theologians like Schleiermacher, even people with mostly bad ideas still contribute to the tradition by the negation of their ideas. I would say Arius and Nestorius contributed to the development of Christian theology because they gave everyone an example of what not to believe. Now, very few people are completely solid or completely heretical. Uh, it's, it's very rare that you get examples of people like Arius or Nestorius who are, like, completely off the wall and we shouldn't follow them on anything. Most of the great, or most of the influential theologians in church history are really a mix. In some ways, we should affirm their theology, and in some ways, we should reject it. And Karl Barth is one of the clearest examples of, of that. So I still need to read more Karl Barth, but those are my thoughts about his ideas based on the limited reading of him that I've done. <laughs>